Welcome to the job, Nick. It's disturbing to think that part of the job of trying to tell Israel's story is happening not only on is not happening on an even playing field because there is so much violent intimidation happening on the other side and still trying to persuade the media through respectful and peaceful language. I want to talk to you a little bit about the media atmosphere. I, 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 you, you can do respectful. I'll yeah. do peaceful. I so, saw. Okay. I tr- well, you know, it's becoming increasingly difficult to be respectful when coming up against the sheer deluge of lies and vitriol. Oh, I know. I mean, I mean, every day we have to shovel through huge steaming piles of horse shit. It is, <laughs> and it and it becomes increasingly difficult to maintain that facade of being passive aggressive. I want to show you one example, actually, because I think sometimes people don't understand how the media will manipulate things against us. This was an exchange I had just the other day on Channel 4 with uh, Krishnan Gurumurthy, <laughs> who was asking me about the 13 UNRWA staff members who participated in the October 7 massacre. Mm. And he asked me, have you presented the evidence to the United Nations and other parties? And I said, I personally do not know. I'm not privy to what intelligence has been passed between our agencies. Continue to harangue, so you don't know, you don't have evidence, you don't have evidence, you don't have evidence. And I pushed back and I said, I can't speak specifically to that, but that's the tip of the iceberg of the collusion and complicity between UNRWA and Hamas, because there was literally a Hamas server farm underneath UNRWA headquarters, leaching its electricity. And he pushes back and, well, let's have a watch and see how that exchange went. This was cut from the broadcast interview. (laughs) They put it up online after I complained. I can tell you what we did expose this week. We revealed that Hamas had been running a massive server farm, the nerve center of its intelligence operations, from a bunker 20 meters underneath the UNRWA compound in Gaza. Not only that, it had been leaching electricity. Can we stick to these allegations? Well, because again, I mean, again... I mean, these are claims that you're making. They can't be confirmed. No, these aren't claims we're that we're making, Kristen. No, we took journalists. They are literally the claims Times. that you're making and they oh. can't Krishnan, be verified. The so New York let, Times... Let's stick to... Krishnan, the New York Times was one of many international media outlets that was embedded with the Israeli army and went yeah. to see and photograph for themselves the Hamas server farm my underneath UNRWA's no. compound in Gaza. So he keeps hammering back on this very specific point. When I said, look, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Reuters, AP, AFP, they were all there. They went to see it for themselves. And and one of the challenges then is that I find anything the Palestinians say will automatically and Mm -hmm. uncritically be parroted, including casualty numbers presented by Hamas. The same Hamas that claims to have destroyed a thousand Israeli tanks didn't happen. Whereas anything that Israel says is Israel claims we haven't been able to independently verify it. These are just claims you're making, even when these are claims in which the international... Why... Do you identify within the Western media this proclivity to accept uncritically what the Palestinians say and anything Israel says is always treated much more suspect? First of all, I don't want Christian Guru Murphy over my shoulder this much longer. Fixed. Yeah. Um, uh, It was unnerving me. Um, Well... One explanation for that is, is what's known as Moynihan's Law... Uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the late great Democrat senator, had a, a, a term which he used when he was ambassador to the United Nations in the 70s, which was that there, there is, a, there is an in, intrinsic problem in democracies and countries that respect human rights, which is that we, the, these countries, are countries in which human rights abuses get reported. Uh, in time, he pointed out, it's possible that since you do not hear of human rights abuses in countries that do not care about human rights, you will only hear about them in the countries that do. Mm. And in time, you may come away with the idea that the countries that most abuse human rights are the ones that abuse them the least. Because they report them. Because they report them. Right. So, for instance, when Israel makes any mistake on the battlefield, it, it's, 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 it's out there. There's, you know, nothing you can do like that horrible, tragic incident with three hostages who were shot. Yeah. I and mean, by the way, unbelievable... sometimes I find, and it's extremely painful for me, when interviewers bring up the three hostages who were tragically yeah, yeah, shot yeah, by yeah. our forces. And sometimes when they yes. tell me those three hostages were, mo- were killed by Israeli forces, it feels malicious. It, it feels, is. You're right. It is malicious. It's I'm malicious. It it's up. malicious. Of course. 
they say they even kill their own. Why do they do that? Because they want to hurt you. They want to hurt you. Why? Uh, you're a Jew and you're a Zionist. And that explains why in Western media outlets they raise this very sensitive point as if to... Well, what are they trying... Well, what point me, are they trying to well, make let me, let me let me dig down deeper on that, just because it's an interesting corner there. Why do they say genocide in Gaza? Because it's been... The wet dream of every anti-Semite since the end of the Holocaust to hold the Jews up in an international court on uh, charges that they are the true Nazis. Sure. And to hurt you. When they call you the new Nazis, why would they do that? Of all the figures in history to seize upon, why do they do Nazis? Because they want to hurt you. They want to wound you as deeply as possible. And they have chosen these weapons in the knowledge that it's how you hurt Jews. That's why. They've been doing it for years. They've been doing it for years. They, they could easily choose something else to do or to say, some other analogy to pull up if there's a mistake on the battlefield. Uh, they, they were thrilled, a lot of the international media, at that awful, unimaginable thing. Can you imagine the soldiers who made that mistake? Can you imagine well, how they, they live, to live, with, with, live with themselves? There were more than three casualties there. The, the three poor young men who were killed and the person responsible for killing them. Um, at least sympathy should be due in such a situation. But and no, find that we've there was that a sort of... Glee. Yes, yes, None. yes. Because because of this, this dynamic we're getting to the root of here, this dynamic of what do you actually want here? Do you want Israel to win? Do you want them to draw? Or do you want them to lose? For instance, very, very important dynamic. But this one about believing Hamas and not believing Israel, it's... Um, it's it's an extension of something I've seen all my life co covering the conflicts in this region, which is that it's a, just a lot easier to take that view. It's a lot easier to take Hamas's body count figures and just report them. You know, a bomb landed an hour ago, 500 people are dead, strangely round number, considering it took months for Israel to work out how many people were killed on the 7th of October, because it takes time. Um uh, but there's a reason why, why people accept that figure, those figures, and they accept them because it's a lot easier than sending your own journalists into an incredibly dangerous area with an incredibly dangerous group of people, Hamas, and trying to verify it. To the credit of the international media, they do press on the question of why their journalists are not allowed independent access into yeah. Gaza, and the Israeli Supreme Court has already ruled on that issue because of fears about exposing troop movements. Yeah, and the, 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 but the point with this is, if they do want to go like that, they know how dangerous it would be. If you're a Western journalist, you can put your, your, your life in the hands of the IDF and in bed with the, with the IDF in Gaza, as I've done, or you could try to go in with Hamas, and you better keep your fingers crossed. And then we've seen in previous conflicts as well where they then... They will never release footage when the journalists have been in Gaza, never mm -hmm. release footage of dead Hamas terrorists, mm -hmm. never release footage of rockets being fired from mm -hmm. the middle of urban areas, mm -hmm. because they know that Hamas will dictate the terms yeah. of what they can let out of Gaza. And they know in this war as well that the information coming out of Gaza is what Hamas wants them to but see. I, I've, I've seen this all my life in this conflict. Um, uh, I have a friend uh, who's a Palestinian journalist, uh, lives in Jerusalem, who um, you probably know, uh, who can't go to the West Bank uh, um, since he was rude about Yasser Arafat many years ago um, and, you know, exposed his corruption and so on. It was made perfectly clear to my friend that he was, if you come back, you'll be hanged from a lamppost. Well, Palestinian journalists learn from that sort of thing. Um, I can't help... And therefore self-censor. Yes, yes. And, and Palestinian journalists in Gaza, are you joking? By contrast, I mean, I do notice that the Israeli media is not um, shy about being rude about Benjamin Netanyahu or indeed any other uh, politician. They speak, as we say, frankly. They speak frankly. And good luck to them. That's what it's like being in a, in a noisy democracy. But again, we should be aware of the vulnerability here. The mistake can arise that Israel is the one in the tricky situation the the wrong situation. Look, even even Haaretz says this about uh, the prime minister. Right. Ah, what do the Palestinians say about their leadership? Oh, they seem fine with it. Yes, and I've had that in a BBC interview where they quoted uh, Chaim Levinson 
piece saying that the IDF is putting lipstick on nonsense. And the BBC journalist asked me, that is what you are doing. You are putting lipstick on nonsense. Fairly bizarre accusation. It's a to weird place. phrase. And then, yes, a very weird phrase, very weird phrase. But uh, look, another of the things that I'm finding speaking with the international media, that's very difficult to get this point across. We have actually a clip, I think one of the first viral moments that you had in this war, speaking about the question of proportionality. Let's watch this. This is terribly, like this format is very much like this is your life. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's do another one of those in 40 years. (laughs) I've always thought that the whole idea of proportionality and conflict is absurd. Um, It's something which I think Western countries and the UN, who always gang up on Israel whenever Israel is is attacked, it's something that these people always obsess about only in the case of Israel. What is proportionate in a conflict? Mm. Proportionate in this conflict would mean that uh, the response to the massacre of more than a 1,000 Israelis in cold blood by Hamas a couple of weeks ago Uh, should be responded to by Israel by sending Israeli forces to rape exactly the same number of women as Hamas raped and to decapitate exactly the Mm. same number of babies as Hamas decapitated and to steal hundreds of Palestinians and hold them in dungeons and torture them as Hamas did. I mean, it's obscene to even think in these terms. And yet that's what proportionality would mean This is one of the things that I'm having difficulty with, and it comes up in every interview as the death toll, whatever it may be, rises. And there is clearly a great deal of suffering in Gaza, which we don't belittle or downplay for a Mm. moment. But I say, they ask me, you know, why is this happening? How long is the killing going to continue? And I say, look, we didn't want this war. We didn't start this Mm. war. We didn't expect this war. Hamas declared war on us. None of this would be happening. If Hamas had not declared this war and if it were not fighting using the evil strategy of deliberately and strategically embedding itself under civilian areas. And I had this argument in a Sky News interview with Yalda Hakim as well. I said, you are falling into Hamas's trap when you take this suffering and you blame Israel instead of the terror organization that launched this war, that is deliberately fighting this war from inside hospitals and under graveyards and tunnels under schools, you are playing into the strategy of the terror organization that is happy for the suffering to be disproportionate because it pulls on your heartstrings Mm. and generates the pressure that will let Hamas escape this war on its feet. To me, this point is so obvious, maybe because I've said it in 250 interviews. Why, Why am I struggling to get that message across? I don't know if if you are struggling with it or not. Um, Well, if you think the message is getting through, then that would definitely give me a nice boost of motivation. I mean, I hope it's getting through. It'll get through with some people. It'll get through to those with ears to listen, you know. And I hope there are quite a lot of them. But are they listening? Well, I believe that, that, that there are still some, a majority, I think. Thanks for watching. Drop a comment below. Don't forget to like, share, and hit subscribe to stay updated with our latest content. Until next time, stay informed and inspired. This is Dajabnik signing off.